Good morning, Kingdom Rise Church. You have made it to another Sunday. You've made it through another week. You have overcome. You have fought through. You pressed through. You prayed through. You cried through. And maybe some of you have even clapped through. I pray that you've done all the above. Sometimes with God, although he's the only choice, sometimes our response in what gets thrown at us is multiple choice. But with that being said, let's jump straight into a message this weekend that I believe is going to encourage everybody, not just renew you, not just equip you, but refresh you. This message is about encountering God in the person of Jesus, our refreshing, refreshing, uh, revolutionary. Have you met heaven's refreshing revolutionary? And I believe that this is gonna really stir up our hearts. It's gonna open up the eyes of our hearts. It's gonna remind us and activate in us just how powerful, how beautiful, how committed God was and continues and will forever be to his bride, you and I, the church. So let's begin this message and this moment in the right atmosphere with prayer. Lord, I thank you that in all of your doing and all the things that you've orchestrated and all the things that you know, past, present, and future, you chose us. You chose us. You pulled us out of our messes, God, to show the message of your love through us. Lord, I thank you that what you have planted in us, that you fertilize, that you continue to water, Lord, is going to be fruitful and multiply to bring you glory. I thank you, Lord, for those that know you and have yet to know you, and through this message, will get to be closer to you and understand your heart towards the sinner and the saint alike. I thank you, Spirit of God, because this is a season, a moment of refreshing. Refresh us today, God. Strengthen us. Remind us that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Have your way. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. You all know as we are in our third week in the book of John chapter 10, we are picking back up as Jesus continues to remind us that he is and forever will be the good shepherd. He is the highest model of the good shepherd. The shepherd doesn't shepherd because of benefit. He shepherds because of burden. I love it that that dynamic, that reality, that heartbeat, that commitment, that pursuit that Jesus displayed and continues to actually function and move in, even in heaven. I don't know if you realize that, but Jesus continues to be the mediator, the intercessor for all of humanity in heaven's holiest of holies, in the throne room, the courts of heaven. Jesus is there at the right hand of the Father, and he is saying, as he looks to you and I, as he considers every happening and every going, they they look to Jesus. When God the Father looks towards you, he sees and he hears the heart, and he identifies and recognizes the righteousness of the blood that covers each of us, the price that's been paid to set us free. So I love that about today. Today is about us being refreshed, being reminded, and we go and we step in and we see that Jesus is the good shepherd. He's not being received, however, and I'm not I'm sure that none of us are surprised that the religious continue to be completely disturbed agitated, angered, they continue to conspire and even perspire in their anger. I don't know if you know what it's like when you eat too much meat, but it's something we call meat sweats. And some of the men a few weeks ago, we went out to eat and some of these brothers ate too much meat. And so they were going through some meat sweats. Well, these guys had mean sweats. They were sweating because they were so mad at Jesus. They were so mad that they could, as they say, proverbially spit. And if you know anything about Jewish culture, as we've spoken about before, a Jewish spitting is the lowest level of honor, the highest level of disrespect. And so these men were at a, they had a spitting level, uh, I guess on the radar or the scale, they're at the lowest, at the very bottom. They were so mad at Jesus. Jesus is saying, I'm the shepherd, the sheep hear my voice. And because you don't recognize my voice, it's because you're not my sheep. And so with that, let's take that understanding as the foundation and premise for this morning's message as we pick back up in the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 17. Let's go there. Therefore, my Father loves me because I lay 
down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my father. Therefore, there was a division again among the Jews because of these sayings. And many of them said, he has a demon and is mad. Why do you listen to him? Others said, these are not the words of one who has a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Now, it was the feast of dedication in Jerusalem, and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple and in Solomon's porch. Then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, How long do you keep us in doubt? You are the Christ. Tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. As I said to you, my sheep hear my voice and know them and they follow me. And I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. I and my father are one. As you already know, Kingdom Arise, we're going to pick this up in the Passion Translation as well. The Father has an intense love for me. I love this about the, the Passion Translation. You can feel the passion and the compassion. The Father has an intense love for me because I freely give my own life to raise it up again. I surrender my own life. And no one has the power to take my life from me. I have the authority to lay it down and the power to take it back again. This is the destiny my father has set before me. This teaching set off another heated controversy among the Jewish leaders. Many of them said, this man is a demon-possessed lunatic. Why would anyone listen to a word that he says? But then there were others who weren't so sure. His teaching is full of insight. These are not the ravings of a madman. How could a demonized man give sight to one born blind? The time came to observe the winter feast of renewal in Jerusalem. And Jesus walked into the temple area under Solomon's covered walkway. When the Jewish leaders encircled him and said, How much longer will you keep us in suspense? Tell us the truth and clarify this for us once and for all. Are you really the Messiah, the anointed one? Jesus answered them, I have told you the truth already and you did not believe me. The proof of who I am is revealed by all the miracles that I do in the name of my Father. Yet, you stubbornly refuse to follow me because you are not my sheep. As I've told you before, my own sheep will hear my voice and I know each one and they will follow me. I give to them the gift of eternal life and they never, they will never be lost and no one has the power to snatch them out of my hands. My Father who has given them to me as his gift is the mightiest of all, and no one has the power to snatch them from my Father's care. The Father and I are one. Now, I believe you understand when I talk about the, the refreshing revolutionary. 
It is so refreshing to look at the life of Jesus. The highest demonstration. Forget example. He is a demonstration. What's a demonstration? A demonstration is the true application of something. He is the living and was and forever will be the demonstration of humility, sacrifice, purity, purpose, and power on the face of the earth. No one has, nor will anyone ever move in the anointing, the power, the purpose that Jesus carried and that Jesus continues to carry now at the right hand of the Father. So we look at this scripture and I get so excited because I'm like, some people, and I know that because this is the fourth time, remember this, this is the fourth gospel. We are finishing strong. Remember, it's not how you start, it's how you finish in life and in anything you begin. And I believe that there is such a, a momentum that we are gaining as we step into the year 2023. And it is not just a momentum for a year, but it is, it is a momentum that marks the journey or the beginning of a new season. And this season is a season that begins in refreshing. Refreshing that, you know what, what Jesus needs you to do is okay. Don't apologize and don't be intimidated by man by people's opinions, by being liked, by being appreciated, by being affirmed by anyone else other than Jesus Christ. I believe that there's a fresh dimension that comes with the season of conviction. See, conviction becomes the compass. It's the internal compass of the soul. And God today is giving us fresh conviction as we look to him and how he managed the anointing he carried, as he managed the authority that he was given and has how he moved and the power that had been delegated to him by God the Father. So let's pick this back up as we always go line by line and we're going to begin in verse 17. And it says, the Father has an intense love for me because I freely give my own life to raise it up again. I love that Jesus says, look, I'm not focused on the, the halfway point. I'm not looking to get to the middle of the, 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 my life. I'm looking to how I'm going to finish. I am more committed to the, I'm not, we're not so consumed by the pain of the process, but of the purpose at the end. And many times you and I today, when we're getting refreshed by this revolutionary called Jesus Christ, we are reminded that the pain is but fleeting. It's but a moment, but purpose will take you into eternity. Purpose will mark how you finish and whether you finish well. So as we look to Jesus, we can, we can be stirred up to faith. Our faith is stirred up and strengthened. And the scripture says that as we answer in faith, as we walk in faith, as we speak in faith, as we move in faith, we are given new measures, dimensions of faith. New dimensions of faith have a very unique component that comes with it. New dimensions of faith will allow you to move into new dimensions of revelation. It will allow you to enter into new realms of authority. It will allow you to understand the deep and hidden things. To most people, this is an old, dusty book. You and I know that there's nothing old and nothing dusty about this book. This is a living sword. So if you're ready to go to battle and you know that you're called to win, you have to start with God's playbook and stop playing with the toys of man. Today, God is impress what well, he's impressing upon us. He's stirring up in us a refreshing of his spirit. It is very dangerous when the end time church wants to quote scripture wants to reference the old prophets, wants to talk about the old generals of faith absent of the power, the covering, and the leading of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is what brings us the refreshing. And today I want to encourage each of us to dig deeper, dive deeper, go deeper. God is going to build and is building an amazing bride before he comes. And if he's going to build a big bride, if he's going to build high, he has to dig deep. And today he's digging deeper and wider with each of us today. And it is this intense love of God that we encounter in verse 17 that I believe has to be that thing that gives us, that wakes us up, that reminds us. We saw what happened to the uh, football player and that they, were, they gave him CPR for nine minutes on the field. And if anybody watched any clips of, what, of the faces 
of the weight of the concern of the care that occurred in that moment when in the unknown places and spaces in that moment when this man's condition was unknown, they kept giving CPR. And I believe that that is a great type and shadow if you look to Jesus and his love. Jesus will give you as much CPR as you need to revive you. He will keep pumping, pumping. They gave him CPR for nine minutes. The condition is a cardiac condition that this gentleman experienced. Uh, Damar, I forget his last name, but he had a cardiac uh, issue in which his heart stopped because of the way he was hit. It messed up his body's rhythm the rhythm of the heart, and it messed it up. And so the only thing that can bring you back is if you massage and you perform CPR. CPR is a way to protect somebody and revive somebody in this particular instance. And so obviously we already know that he's woken up and he's on the other side of this journey of healing and of restoration. Thank you, Jesus. But it really reminds me of the intense love. And you saw the affection in the stadium. You saw the mood change. And I believe that we need to get to a place with Jesus individually and corporately, as the bride of Christ, as the sons and daughters of God, as the New Testament church, we need to get to a place of intense love. Where the condition of every person that walks into the church is important to us. Are we willing to take the time to give each person CPR? Are we willing to pray with them? Are we willing to cry with them? Are we willing to stand in the gap for them? Will we carry their burdens with them? That requires at the very core of every believer Intense love. And this intense love is demonstrated because Jesus says this intense love that I have with the Father or that he has for me is because I will freely lay down my life. I'm not going back. And I believe that today God is reminding us of why we started this journey with him to begin with. Because you're not going back. Say this with me. I'm not going back. I'm not going back. And that's what we have to remind ourselves every single day, every day that we have breath. I'm not going back. I am moving forward. I love it because I was meeting with one of the elder pastors that gives me a lot of guidance, Pastor Lawrence. And Pastor Lawrence says, you know, Pastor Ray, every single morning, the first thing I do, and I look to my notes is, Lord, what are my, ready, checking in for duty, Lord, what are my orders? So he has that written down in his Bible. And every single day, he asks the Lord, what are my orders? I'm checking in. And I love that because sometimes as human beings, we have such a desire because life gets hard. There's moments that are desperate. There's places that seem like they're very unknown and foreign to us. And we don't fit in, we don't belong, and we don't know what to do. But what's beautiful is when you say, Lord, here I am. What are my orders? It reminds you that you've been purchased at a great price and you've been purchased to serve, not just to receive. The beauty of the New Testament church and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is to give us the power, the infilling of the Holy Spirit was to give us power. So now as Christians, we're being refreshed so that we become power plants, not reservoirs, but power plants. People that don't just hold water, but can give water. People that receive the anointing, but also can release the anointing. We don't just get to be recipients. We also now get to be releasers. That's the difference between the Old Testament tabernacle and temple and belief system with the Jews to now the New Testament church that has the ability to move in miracles, signs, and wonders according to what Jesus promised. Today, you and I are inheritors of the promise. And I'm not just talking about the promise of eternal life. Don't live for eternity, live for now as well. And how are you living or how well are you doing with the life that you're living today? Are you waiting for the miraculous to happen once you get to heaven? Or are you ready to move in the miraculous today? Is your, are your kids waiting for you to go to heaven to get things right? Or will you work towards getting things right today? Will you get that marriage worked on today? Or are you going to wait to heaven to see if God will just give you some credit and some cute points for the, for the attempts and the fails, but you never actually push through to break through? I believe that God is giving us power, not just to access to eternity, but we have access through the power of communion because now we are the New Testament church. Now we are the living temples, the living tabernacles. And with that, what? The curtain, the veil has been torn. So now we have direct access to God, not just for conversation, but to speak things, to release the will of heaven on earth.
I know that for those of us that were began on Wednesday, God had given our church, every year God gives our church a word. Every year, each household, and I challenge those who are listening today, every year I highly recommend to fast and pray before each new year with purpose, on purpose. Why? Because in that moment of fasting and praying, it's going to prepare you. It's going to calibrate you. It's going to detox you. It's going to remind you. It's going to bring a lot of clarity to you about your life, what is all that and what isn't all that and what needs to be dealt with. So that when you step into that new year, you're ready to run. And though that's what's so important is that we, we fast, we pray, and we get to a place where we ask the Lord for a personal word. So we have a corporate word, but we challenge every person that's a son and daughter of God to have a personal vision, a personal word for every single year. What's your assignment? What's God going to challenge you? And, and you need to speak it to remind yourself, but you also need to let people know that are other believers. So there's accountability and they're going to say, how is that? How's that vision working out for you? Or what's going to be the mission? What's going to be the strategy to fulfill that vision for your life this year? And then there's accountability, there's encouragement. There's like, hey, have you done it? How are you doing with that? Everybody, the body, the body of Christ needs to have corporate vision, but the believer must have personal vision as well. And so the vision for 2023 for Kingdom Rise Church is invasion of heaven, that we are undergoing an invasion of heaven, that we're not just gonna think that there could be angels in the room, but we're fully convinced, committed, and, and moving in the company of the council of heaven, that we have the power of the Holy Spirit present and available at our disposal and that there's angels in the room all the time. We are not the type of Christians that think that we can just do, do be tag team partners with Jesus. Tag your in, tag your out. No, Jesus is ride or die. Jesus is with you all the time. He is like your Siamese twins. He's attached to you at the spiritual hip. He's going nowhere. And when you have the awareness, the Christ consciousness, not the sin consciousness of condemnation, but the Christ consciousness of conviction, which is a, comes with the fire of God and the anointing of God. Now you say, I live different and I'm going to stay walking down this different path. I'm going to stay more committed, more disciplined, and more on fire because I'm not the same. And now I have company with the King of Kings. When you have company with the King of Kings, now you have a different attitude. You have a different approach to things. There's a different confidence. There's a divinity. There's a godliness and an authority in you that stirs you up not to be intimidated by circumstances. A couple of weeks ago, we were going through scriptures and as we were doing our one-year devotional. And in the book of Luke, Jesus is talking about having faith enough to move a mountain, the faith of a mustard seed to move a mountain. And I was talking to a young man and I was sharing with them, and I was saying, many times people hear the scriptures and they think literally. And I'm sure that there's people in the world that laugh. They laugh at that scripture that talks about faith to move mountains. And I shared and I highlighted and I illuminated that this was not literally moving mountains, but speaking to situations in our lives that appear as intimidating and as large as mountains. And God, is, if he's with you, if God is for you, who can be against you? It doesn't matter the size of your circumstances. Speak to it. And if you're obedient and if you're in love with God and you're submitted to God and you have an intense love like God the Father has for Jesus, which we are now called to have for Jesus, the groom, as we are the bride of Christ, we, we now have the authority to speak to things and things will change. Verse 18, I surrender my own life and no one has the power to take my life from me. How do you like that about confidence? How do you like that about certainty? There is no if, ands, or buts. There is no bookie. There are no percentages. There are no odds in Jesus' mind or in his heart or in his future about the certainty of his authority. Jesus knew that if I give up my life, it's only because I give it up. Nobody can take from me what I carry. No one can, can rob from me. Nobody can steal from me what I've been given by God the Father. What is mine is mine. And with that certainty, I don't see humility. I see divinity. And some of us today, we know the cute, sheepish little lamb that's innocent and we kind of really take an approach or the world is taking an approach that the lamb is weak, but we don't understand that the lamb is actually meek. Meek means modest. Meek means that takes the lowly place. Meek is, 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 is a character that is full of humility. 
that is a reservoir of God's goodness, that, it, that is patient, that is kind, that is loving, but not weak. Not only that, Jesus, as he's coming a second time and a final time, he's coming back as a lion. See, we have to start looking to the church, this church that is not just a church for lambs, but a church that is raising a pride of lions. Today, the church must have some spiritual cajones. They got to have some gonads and we got to go for it. We have to have this same confidence, this confidence that Jesus knew and shares with us in verse 18. And no one has the power to take my life for me. from me. I have the authority to lay it down and the power to take it back again. What in your life have you given up on? What in your life have you Give, de, have accepted defeat? What part of your life, what relationship, what part of your mind, what part of your past, what part of your body, what part of your person have you surrendered and just given up on? You have bailed out. You've just accepted that that's just the way it's going to be. I'm going to be stuck with the situation. I made my bed and now I got to lay in it. And God says, no, you need to have my confidence. You need to get closer to this intense love that I have with the Father. And in that intensity, you're going to go into the fire. We've talked about the fire. Fire is necessary. Fire purifies. Fire, what heats up, it protects, it warms, and it ignites others to fire. And so we, we're, we see this power and this confidence that God says, pick up the authority of God. Pick up your kingdom authority. Quit looking to what the world says you can or cannot do. The, world, the world's trying to judge you by your ethnicity, by your education, by your financial ability or inability. They're trying to set limits on you, but God has already taken off the lid. I love it that when you understand that there's, we're going through an invasion of heaven, that the, the windows of heaven are wide open. I don't even see windows. I just see like a dome. Anybody who watches football, there's like a, some of these brand new stadiums have domes and the whole thing retracts. And if you look at heaven and the dynamic of heaven, I believe that in this season, in this part of our lives, in this chapter of the church, that the entire ceiling has come off. That there is such an access and such a purity and such a power. There's such an intense love that God has for humanity that he wants to use us. He wants to tag us. He wants to get us off the spiritual bench, bench of life. And he wants to get us in the game. What good is a Christian if he can't get up? What good is a Christian if he's tired? What good is a Christian if he's depressed? What good is a Christian if he has no energy? What is good is a Christian if he has no vision? What good is a, a, a Christian if he has no voice? That's what is required to us. This is what God is trying to refresh and remind us of is it is time for us to pick up our authority and to move in power that no one, no power in heaven and earth can take away but Jesus. 19, this teaching set off another heated controversy among the Jewish leaders. Are you surprised? I know we're not. Many of them said, this man is demon-possessed, a demon-possessed lunatic. Not surprised again. I am shocked. And then at the same time, I'm completely disappointed that those who are supposed to reflect the authority, the honor, the character of God were the very people that could not recognize the shepherd. They were showing and exposing themselves as being the true demon-possessed or vehicles of de demonic possession as they came to crucify and rebel against the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And it says here, why would anyone listen to a word he says? Can you imagine that someone sits in God's physical presence? Hear what I'm saying? Because I think sometimes we, 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 we make Jesus too small. We said that Jesus was man. Jesus was fully man, but he was also fully God. Let me say that one more time. Jesus wasn't just fully man, he was also fully God. So when these people had the guts to say these things about Jesus, they weren't just saying them to Jesus, they were saying them to God's face. These men that were supposed to represent and have a tethered hardline connection, forget Bluetooth, forget Wi-Fi, they were supposed to be hardwired to God. And they were fully disconnected. They could not recognize the love of God. They could not recognize the breath of God, the compassion of God. It wasn't even in their reality. And so much so that they were ready to call him a demon and a lunatic. 
21. But then there were others who weren't so sure. And I love this because this is not the Jewish elders. We're talking about the people, the populace, the Jews. His teaching is full of insight. These are not the ravings of a madman. How could a demonized man give sight to one born blind? I love it that there's somebody in the, in, the, in the body of Christ, there's somebody in the church, there's someone in the tabernacle that has a heart and a mind that works together. I really believe that one of the key ingredients to the Holy Spirit is that it creates a synergy, a connection between the mind of man and his heart. And it brings it into what? Into rhythm. There's a stride. There's a momentum in a rhythm to the spirit. And what we do as a New Testament church is that now there's a connection that allows us to identify and discern things that the average person cannot, even within the body of Christ. Believe it or not, there's a lot of Christians and a lot of them do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And whether they're Christians or not, that's for a different day and a different conversation. So the key is this. These people recognize that it was impossible for a demon to make a man have sight. How is it possible? And it doesn't make sense. And it's true because it doesn't make sense. Jesus at the Feast of Renewal, verse 22. The time came to observe the winter Feast of Renewal in Jerusalem. Jesus walked into the temple area under Solomon's covered walkway when the Jewish leaders encircled him. I love this. Jesus always just rolled up. He, he, he drove it like he owned it. I love that about Jesus. Jesus, whenever he went to the temple, he just, he just took authority. He didn't say, excuse me, can I speak? He just spoke. That speaks to confidence. That speaks to authority. There was an air about Jesus. Sometimes the religious, they could not, they could not argue with the atmospheric change. They just didn't like sharing the altar with this man. They didn't want to share with the, someone who questioned why they did what they did. Those who questioned the hearts and the motive of the religious. That's what they didn't, could not stand about Jesus. So Jesus walks into the temple area under Solomon's covered walkway. And it says that the Jewish leaders encircled him like a bunch of piranhas, like a bunch of sharks. They were ready for a feeding frenzy. And so they said, we're going to bust Jesus right now. And so they proposed this question to Jesus, how much longer will you keep us in suspense like Jesus had been hiding it? Tell us the truth and clarify this for us once and for all. What they were basically saying is like, bust yourself. Are you really the Messiah, the anointed one? And this is how Jesus, our Lord and Savior, answers calmly and confidently. And Jesus answers them, I have told you the truth already. And you did not believe me. The proof of who I am is revealed by all the miracles that I do in the name of my Father. The proof is in the pudding. I'm the one doing the miracle signs and wonders, not you. So you tell me who's got the power and who is experiencing a power outage and who has been experiencing a power outage for thousands of years. It's never been me. 28, yet you stubbornly refuse to follow me because you are not my sheep as I have told you before. So Jesus says, look, your inability to acknowledge me, recognize me, and honor me is because you do not know and you do not have what you profess to have, which is a relationship with God. You do not know God, you know of God, you know how to, to perform for a God, but you do not have communion with the said God because the re I'm the real McCoy. I'm right here, and you don't even know it. Talk about real blindness. 28, I give to them the gift of eternal life, and they will never be lost, and no one has the power to snatch them out of my hands. I love this about Jesus, because this scripture is, should be a life scripture for any person that is a blood-bought, newborn believer a born-again believer. You need to make this one of your life scriptures. John 10, 28. I give to them the gift of eternal life. God gives you a gift. You don't gift yourself. So the, the fact that you're saved today, the fact that we're having this conversation, the fact that heaven is speaking into us and through us today is because God has given us a gift, a gift that we could not give ourselves. And they will never be lost and no one has the power to snatch them out of my hands. Once you're in the hands of Jesus, no one can pluck you out. You might delay it. There might be challenges. It might get hard. It might get lonely. 
But Jesus will never let you go. Once God says you're mine, you're his. And we have to understand that. There's a finality to salvation. You know, once saved, always saved. I believe that because once you're truly saved, you will stay saved. You may have challenges. You may have opposition. You may have resistance. You may have fear. You may have doubts. But you, what you can't do is you can't get rid of Jesus. The truth is, is that it's not how you start. It's how you finish. And anyone who's truly saved and blood bought won't just start well, they'll finish well. And today we have to have the confidence that God through scripture tells us that we carry a gift, we have a gift, we are, we are the recipients of a gift that only God could give you because God loves you. He has an intense love for every single one of us today. 29, my father who has given them to me as his gift. So your salvation is a gift to Jesus for the surrender that Jesus made. When he laid down his life, it was the result of that was the gift of him and you and I in him spending eternity together, no longer defeated, no longer sinners, but righteousness because of his sacrifice. And it says here, no one has the power to snatch them from my father's care. So I love that Jesus says, not only can they not snatch them from me, they can't snatch them from dad, my father. That is a reassurance and a confirmation. For those who are spiritual, we understand something. Anything that is of God will be confirmed. God will confirm it. That means that it'll be, there'll be a second voice. You'll understand there something will happen. Scripture will speak something to you, but it'll confirm it. It'll reassure that it's God and not just a good idea. And as we close in verse 30, and the Father and I are one. The Father and I are one. It is so important today to understand is as we began we we're talking about an intense love between the Father and the Son. And as we close, we understand that the Father and I, the Father and Jesus are one. See, that is what that is the beginning and that is the end. That is the alpha and the omega of all scripture. They're one. And that oneness that God has, the triune God, the Trinity, the God, the Father, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit has brought us in, grafted us and created us, formed us and birthed us for this generation. And with that, I'm going to pray that we would get refreshed and that we would, that we would fall under and commit and be reminded and be given confidence to walk in the purpose that we've been called to according to the authority and power of the blood of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this time. I thank you for this moment. I thank you for this new season. Forget the new year. It's a new season. This isn't just a, 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 another year to try to be better. Another year to try some experiments and be the guinea pig. This is the year where the rubber meets the road and we're stepping into more than a new year. We're stepping into a new season. I thank you, Spirit of God, because we give you permission, heaven, to invade our lives. To invade our bodies every molecule, every part, the hidden parts, the broken parts, the parts where we might be ashamed of and the parts that we have a complete confidence in you, Lord. Every part of our beings, seen and unseen, known and unknown, Lord. We surrender so that you might invade our lives so that you can live through our lives. That's the good news, that's the gospel. Jesus came to lay his life down to resurrect that we might resurrect because it's no longer we that live, but he that lives in us and through us. Lord, we are not just recipients, we're releasers. So today I release fresh, refreshing right now, right now in the name of Jesus, I release refreshing over your mind, over the mind of every person that is listening today. A refreshing over your heart that it would come back and it would get back in sync. Just like that situation that happened this week where the heart lost its rhythm, its beat. Lord, I'm speaking to somebody and someone today has lost their heart beat. Part of their heart is broken and it's not beating the same. It's not beating with the same confidence. It's not beating with that same certainty. And so today we do spiritual CPR over those who are struggling and need a little bit of love, a touch from Jesus so that they might be refreshed encouraged, renewed, restored, and ready to run. I thank you, Spirit of God, for your Holy Scripture. I thank you, God, for the gift and the blessing of being assigned to read the Gospels. What seemed like a seemingly challenging 
and basic mission is a big and huge revelatory blessing over Kingdom Arise Church. I thank you, Spirit of God, that we don't take lightly the great things you're doing in the small places of our lives. I thank you, God, that the details matter because your divinity and your process matter. Allow us to push through the pain and embrace your purpose. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.